Well, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Well, I hope you all had a good New Year. For us, uh, my family came into town this weekend, and we kind of had our Christmas a few days late, and uh, um, the scripture says to confess sins to one another, so I'm confessing the sin of gluttony right now. Um, <laughs> Mom and Dad brought over prime ribs, so, you know, uh, all bets were off, so it was, it was a good day. <laughs> We'll be in Mark chapter 9, and we'll start at verse 14. So to put this into context, um, Peter, James, and John had just gone up on a mountain with Jesus where Jesus was transfigured before him, where they got to see a glimpse of Jesus' true splendor and majesty. And what a moment that must have been to witness that, to all of a sudden have the veil taken away and to see Jesus' power. But the moment ended, and they come back, back down the mountain, and in verse 14 is where we pick up what Jesus came down to find. And it says, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered them, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy and he fell down to the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth and jesus asked the father how long has he been has this been happening to him and he said since childhood and it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him but if you can do anything have compassion on us to help us and jesus said to him if you can all things are possible for one who believes Amen. immediately the father of the child cried out and said i believe help my unbelief and when Jesus saw the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. After, and after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse. And most said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Well, this is an interesting story. A father brings his son to Jesus so that Jesus can heal him, except he doesn't find Jesus. He finds his disciples instead. So the disciples try to cast out the demon, but they cannot do it. And this angers the father, and it begins this argument with the disciples. And you can imagine what this argument was probably like. Why can't you cast him out? I thought you were supposed to be with Jesus. And the disciples are probably like, well, you must have done something really bad if we can't cast him out. What great sin have you committed? Obviously, it's your fault that we can't cast him out. So Jesus walks up on this scene and asks what's going on, and they tell him. And Jesus kind of makes this statement of annoyance at the whole thing. And he says to the father, bring him to me. And the father says, if you can help us, help us. And Jesus responds, he says, if I can help. He seems to be highlighting the father's doubt a little bit. Now what we're told is that the father came looking for Jesus. So it appears that the father had faith that Jesus could help. But after dealing with the failure of his disciples, it seems like his faith is shaken a little bit. He's no longer sure that it's possible and Jesus picks up on that, and he says, all things are possible for him who believes. And the Father says this, and this is the statement that I really want us to focus on this morning. He says, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. 
These words have stood out to me for years as I have read this passage because there's so much honesty in these words. And I find these words very relatable. I believe, but help my unbelief. Often I think as Christ followers, we live in this tension of faith and doubt. We live in this paradox where faith and doubt coexist at the same time. And this seems to be where the Father is. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Have you ever been there? A place where you believe and doubt at the exact same time? Here's a few ways that might look. Uh, Lord, I believe you can heal any disease. I'm just not so sure you're going to heal mine. Lord, I believe you can provide everything I need, but it seems like I don't have enough. Lord, I believe you can change and save anyone. I'm just not sure you're going to do it for my friend. Lord, I believe you can mend any relationship. I just don't see you mending this one. Have you ever been there? I know I have. God, I know you can do it. I'm just not so sure you're going to do it. This is a common place I think we find ourselves. And this is where the father was. I came here believing you can help my son but I'm not entirely convinced it's going to happen. So help my unbelief, restore my faith. Well, this morning I want to pull a few things out of this and talk about this tension of faith and doubt. And the first one is this, a statement of faith. Immediately the father of the child cried out in verse 24. He said, I believe. While the father had some doubt, we also do see that the father has faith in this story. First, like I said earlier, he came looking for Jesus. He, uh, we don't know how far he came to find him, but he had enough faith to take the initiative and go search out Jesus to heal his son. And then in all the things, Jesus says, um, all things are possible for those who believe. And he cries out, I do believe. One of the things we have in common as followers of Christ is belief. We believe that Jesus is God made flesh. We believe that Jesus is the way of salvation through the cross. We believe that he can save us and transform us. Those are beliefs that we share, and we believe that God has power, power to heal, power to do great things. And those are just building blocks of the Christian faith that we share. And this is where we need to start, to have faith in who Jesus is. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth to the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. We are saved through faith. We are not saved because we do good things. We are saved because we believe. And like the father in the story, true faith is faith that drives us to action. The father didn't stay at home thinking, well, I believe in Jesus, that he can heal my son, but I'm not going to do anything about it. But he believed enough to get out of the house and go search for Jesus. That is the picture of faith. He took action. And that's where I hope we are all at today, that we would say, yes, Lord, I I believe. I believe in who you are. I believe in your power. I believe enough to venture out and follow after you. I believe enough to obey what you tell me to do. And that's where the father was. He said, "I, I, I believe. But then in the same breath, There's doubt. And like I said, I I relate to this all too well. And what the Father gives is, number two, an admission of deficiency. An admission of deficiency. I believe, help my unbelief. The Father said, I believe, but it's also an admission of doubt. Help my unbelief. He admitted that when it came to faith, there was a deficiency there. He believed, but at the same time, He doubted. I heard about a man who fell off a cliff, but managed to grab a tree limb on the way down. And so he's hanging from a cliff by a tree limb, and he called out, is anyone up there? Well, a voice called out, yes, there is. Well, who are you? I am God. Well, God, will you help me? Yes, I will. Do you believe in me? Yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, but I can't hold on for much longer. That's all right. If you believe you have nothing to worry about, let go of the branch. The man sat there for a second and goes, is there anyone else up there? (laughs) I think that illustrates the tension we often live in. 
yes, I believe uh, God. Yes, I believe he can do powerful things. Um, I'm just not so sure I want to let go, though. I'm not sure that uh, I, I have that sort of faith. Sometimes I am amazed at the amount of faith and doubt that lives side by side in my mind at times. I have staked my life on Jesus and my eternity on Jesus. But then life throws circumstances at me that causes me to shrink back and it can cause doubt or, worse yet, want me to do things my own way instead of obey. And here's where the father in a story got it right. He admitted his difficulty. He said, help my unbelief. I have a deficiency of faith. I'm struggling to believe. But maybe it's, uh, for us, maybe it's a deficiency of desire sometimes. Maybe it's struggling wanting to obey. Maybe what we need to do is turn to God and say, God, I believe, help my unbelief, to admit our deficiencies before him. Lord, I want to follow you. Help my stubbornness. Lord, I want to serve you. Help my self-centeredness. But I believe this, that when we come to God of our deficiencies and we admit them and we ask for help, I believe that's a prayer he's going to answer for us. Because God wants to help us in these areas. And the great thing is, Jesus said that faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains, which means, and this is good news for us, it doesn't depend on the size of our faith, but it depends on the object of our faith. You can have great faith in something, but if it's the wrong thing, it's going to fail you. But it's better to have a little faith placed in the right thing than great faith placed in the wrong thing. Because it's not about the size of our faith, it's about the size of God. It's about the object of our faith. Let me put it like this. I grew up ice fishing. Um, Every weekend during the winter, it seemed like we were going out ice fishing. And here's what I learned about ice fishing. 12 inches of ice, extremely safe. If there's 12 inches of ice on the lake, you're good. It doesn't matter. You can stomp. You can about drive a truck out there, which we have before. You're, you're safe with 12 inches of ice. One inch of ice, not so much. You're, you're starting to get a little sketchy at, at one inch of ice. But here's the question. Is it better to have a little bit of faith and 12 inches of ice or great faith and one inch of ice? I think it's better to have a little faith in 12 inches and great faith in one inch. Why? Because no matter how much faith you have in 12 inches, it's still going to hold. Your little faith is going to hold it. It doesn't matter how much faith you place on one inch of ice. It may not hold you. It may be just faith misplaced. And that's what it's like with Jesus, that even a little bit of faith with him is more power than anything else because of who Jesus is. The truth is, we, what we all need is enough faith to simply step out to do what he tells us to do. Amen. It's enough faith to take that step on the ice. <laughs> but there will be times like the Father where we find ourselves with a deficiency of faith or a deficiency in some area of our lives. And that's when we need to cry out to God, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. Or I know for me the prayer has been more like, Lord, I want to follow you. So help me to be willing in the areas that I'm not willing. <laughs> help me to be willing to be willing. Now that's not to say that there's not a point in time where you just need to exercise your will, right? There, there's a point in time where you just need to say, I'm going to obey. But there's also, I believe, God wants to help us in those areas. He wants to build our faith. He wants to transform our desires to match his. And so we can cry out and say, God, I believe, but help me. And the good news is, even when we are weak, he is strong. That's why in 2 Corinthians, Paul said, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more boldly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. So when we come up short, maybe what we need to do is admit it, admit our deficiency and ask him for help. And I believe if we will be honest with ourselves, and we'll be honest with God and ask for his help, the next thing we will see is number three, and that is a display of God's power. 
a display of God's power. Jesus said, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out, convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So most of them said he is dead, but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. The father got to see a first-hand display of Jesus' power. And what we see is that the boy was healed not because the father had some enormous, gigantic faith, but because he had enough faith to bring his son to Jesus. He had enough faith to simply bring his son to Jesus. And as a result, Jesus did what no one else could do. His disciples couldn't do it, but Jesus could. And there's a couple of interesting things at the end of this that I want to point out. Um, first, his disciples came to him and asked, well, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. The interesting thing about that is that Jesus didn't pray before he cast the spirit out. Do you notice that? A lot of times you see Jesus praying before he does a miracle, but in this case, it, it doesn't say that Jesus prayed. But here's what we know about Jesus. He was a person of prayer. He was a man of prayer. Often you see Jesus retreating to solitary places where he would pray, sometimes for long periods of time, sometimes all night long. Jesus had a constant communion with the Father. He was a person of prayer. So when he says this type can only come out through prayer, maybe what he means is you couldn't cast him out because... You're not people of prayer. You don't have a constant communion with God. That God isn't part of your minute-by-minute life. You may pray at times, but it's not a constant conversation with the Father. It's not a priority. So maybe what Jesus is saying is, when we are people of prayer, there is power. When we have that communion with the Father on a regular basis. It's not about just showing up on one event and saying a great prayer. It's about walking with God daily, having that rapport with him. And the other interesting thing is, is what I do know about when you are a person of prayer is God gives you insights into situations and people that you wouldn't otherwise know. He gives you discernment. And this appears to be one of those situations. When the father comes to Jesus, he said that the spirit made his son mute. But when Jesus cast the spirit out, he says, you death and mute spirit come out of him. No one said anything about deafness. Not the disciples, not the Father. But Jesus appears to see something that no one else does. He says, you deaf and mute spirit come out. What I'm saying is this. Prayer has a way of shaping us and a way of giving us discernment beyond ourselves. Where God can give us insights into situations that we couldn't otherwise have. Why? Because we are in communion with the Father on a regular basis. So what if the reason the disciples failed and Jesus succeeded was because of Jesus' constant communication with the Father? Where Jesus walked into this situation and the Father gave him insights that no one else had. This spirit isn't just mute. He's deaf. And here's what else I know. Prayer is a faith builder. Amen. It's a faith builder. That when we take the time to pray and talk to God and allow him to speak, it builds our faith. It builds our confidence and gives us discernment into what is really going on around us. And what God really wants out of our faith is to have enough faith to simply obey. That's really, at the end of the day, what he wants out of our faith. To have enough faith to obey what he tells us to do. Amen. And when we have that... <laughs> Jesus will show up, and we will see displays of power out of Jesus. Right. I heard about a tightrope walker who did incredible stunts all over Europe at tremendously scary heights. And then he stepped it up even more. He would start to do these tightrope acts blindfolded. And then he'd bring a wheelbarrow out on the tightrope with him, and he'd push a wheelbarrow across blindfolded. Well, there was an American promoter who heard about this man, and he wrote him a letter and said, um, I w want to make you a substantial offer to come to America, and I want you to walk across Niagara Falls. Said, I don't believe you can do it, but your fame is spreading, and this would be a great event. I want you to come to Niagara Falls and tightrope across it. Well, 
the tightrope, wrote back and said, I've never seen the falls, but I'll come. I'm willing to do it. So the event was set, and he started on the Canadian side, a huge crowd around him, and he put on a blindfold, and he tightroped across Niagara Falls. Then he grabbed a wheelbarrow, and he did it again, and the promoter said, well, you did it. I can't hardly believe you did it, but you did it. And the tightroper looked at him and said, do you believe I can do it? He said, well, yeah, I just saw you, you do it. He said, no, do you really believe I can do it? Well, yeah, no. Do you believe I can do this? And he said, yes, I believe. He said, okay, hop in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Many of us believe in God's power. That's why we're here. The question is, are we willing to get in and trust him? Are we willing to jump into the wheelbarrow? Are we willing to obey what he calls us to do? I hope the answer is yes. But the good news is this. Even if you're struggling, even if you have a deficiency of faith, like the Father, you can call out, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. And if you come to him open and honest, as the Father did in this story, I believe that we too will see a display of God's power as he works in and through us, and he does what only God can do. So very quickly, before we go, I want to give us three action points today to help us with this. And the first one is this, ask. Ask. Ask God for help. Say, I, I believe, help my unbelief. Be willing to come to God, admit where you fall short, and it's simple yet powerful, ask. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Maybe sometimes the reason that we don't receive is because we simply don't ask. We don't ask of him. Now this isn't a, I always feel like I got to point out that verse, that isn't a blank check to ask God for whatever you want. But I do believe this, when we are praying things like, God, help my unbelief, help me be willing to be willing, those are prayers he wants to answer in us. So when we have a deficiency, ask. Secondly, pray. Pray. Prayer is the lifeblood of a Christian. It's how we can have communion with God any place, any time, anywhere. It's a faith builder. It gives us discernment. It changes our heart. So we need to make prayer a priority in our life. Even if it is just taking moments throughout the day to say quick little prayers like, God help. God thank you. God show me the right thing. Those can make a big difference in our heart and spirit as we simply acknowledge God as we go throughout the day. What difference would it make if once an hour you took even five seconds to just acknowledge God is with you and pray things like, God help, God show me, God thank you for what you're doing. Amen. I believe that could change our hearts and minds very quickly if we did that on a regular basis. Um, and this is something God has been teaching me recently. So I've complained to a few of you. I've been having a fairly constant eye twitch in one of my eyes. It's been going on for like a month. Um, it's really weird, right? Just all of a sudden my eyes start switching and I was praying about this and it felt like God said, it, this is funny, but this is what I felt he told me. Every time it twitches, thank me for something. <laughs> and you know what? The past week, I have been thanking God for a whole lot of things. <laughs> and you know what? It's not annoying me as much. Why? Because it has become a bridge to communicate with God. Now, I am hoping it goes away soon, but what I'm more hoping <laughs> is that it begins to build a pattern in my life Amen. where I am acknowledging God on a regular basis throughout the day. Amen. And then thirdly, obey. Obey. Get in the wheelbarrow with him. <laughs> Venture out in faith and do what he tells you to do. Remembering that it is not about the size of your faith, but it's about the size of God. It's about his power. And if you have enough faith to simply say yes to what God calls you to do, we will see him work firsthand. And not only that, but we get to be part of his work. Amen. So we ask, we pray, and we obey. And I believe when we do that, we'll be able to simply say, God, I believe. 
because he will help us through our unbelief when we are willing to do these things with him. I believe. Lord, help my unbelief. Father, thank you for your word. And God, I thank you for stories like this that I think are so relatable to many of us. Where we believe in you and we want to obey you, but at the same time, too often, there is these doubts holding us back. God, I pray that in each one of us, you would show yourself faithful. That you would help us in our unbelief, or our stubbornness, or our self-centeredness. And help us to have enough faith to simply obey what you tell us to do. And God, I thank you that it does not depend on the size of my faith. Because I'd be in trouble. But thank you that no matter how big or small my faith is, you are enough. That you are powerful enough. And that for whatever reason, you love me enough to stick with me and use me to be part of your plan. So Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Go with him. Ha, ha, ha.